<laughs> COVID two. <laughs> Electric, Electric boogaloo. boogaloo. Yeah, the squeak call. I prefer the squeak call actually. Do you not think? It's, it's a bit nicer. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to another episode of Revolutionary Dispatches. I'm Catherine Wright. And I'm David Bryan. What the hell just happened, David? (laughs) (laughs) A lot. That's my assessment. Yeah. So, there's been much lost sleep over the last week, I'm sure. For many of you, there certainly has for me. I don't know about you, David. My sleep cycle is not yet recovered. (laughs) No. I think it might be a while before it does. So, for for anyone who um, missed the boat a little bit... uh, (laughs) It's possible. I like doing these little introductions in, as if people have been living under under a rock for the last. Yeah. The imaginary years, listener but... who doesn't <laughs> doesn't follow the news apart from us. Yeah, maybe one day, you know, yeah, if we certainly. expand our reach enough, we might be someone's only source of news. Mm. So we have to be responsible because, like, that's that's like the position Fox News is in for half of the United States. Totally right. Um, it will be Trump TV soon. Anyway, so um, yeah, there was an election uh, in the land of our cousins across the sea. Mm. The good old United States of America. Mm. If they're going to pronounce Beautiful our country. words wrong, then I shall do the same yeah. to them. Let this be a lesson to you. 17% <laughs> of our listeners who are American, according to our statistics. Yeah, we know who you are. We don't yeah, actually know who you are. We just know how many of you there are. <laughs> it's fine. We're not coming for you. That's the CIA. Anyway. That is um, the CIA, yes. Yeah. So there was an election and it went... Somewhat differently to how I think we were mostly expecting it to. I think that's fair to say. Yeah, yeah, it's a good way of putting it. Um, the overall result was the same. As it were, the headline is yes. Going into the election, we thought Joe Biden would be president, and he's going to be president. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, he had the biggest polling lead of any person running for president for a very, very long time. Yeah. And he has manifestly not had the biggest landslide of all time. No. So basically, he had, what was it, an 8% lead in the polls, about a 5% lead in the tipping point state, which was uh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Um, And in the end, obviously not all the votes are in, um, I think projections are talking about him winning somewhere around four and a half percent of the vote, uh, probably by the time it's all counted. And in Pennsylvania, that's, that's his lead. Right? He's not just winning yeah, four and a half. Sorry. Votes. Yes. <laughs> no. See, so you, yeah, I'm glad you're on the board, David. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> so I'm obviously not. And in Pennsylvania, he's he's only only about a percent ahead, slightly less, I think. So. Uh, yeah, less. So a polling mess of about four points. In both the nationwide polls and in Pennsylvania, the interesting thing is that that polling miss was not even across all the states. Um, some states were no, sort of bang not. on, um, and others were really way off, like Wisconsin, um, which Joe Biden did win, but extremely narrowly. He had a very, very large lead there, and it was, yeah. and, and he won by an incredibly narrow. He's only ahead by about twenty thousand votes to the point where there, there's a recount um, scheduled for it. Um, so you know, that's, that's twenty thousand votes ahead when there's. You know, over one and a half million votes on either side, so that's a very, very yeah. small margin. Yeah, less than a percent. Yeah, less than half a percent because it's triggered the automatic recount procedure. Yeah, yeah. And he was supposed to win. He was supposed. To, he was. Ahead, he was sort of forecasted to be ahead by about eight point three points. So you know, hmm. real difference there. And sort of all across the board, there's been some very weird results. Yes, the upshot of this, along with the um, the the effects of the pandemic, whereby people are voting by post a lot which makes it uh, means that the, the vote count happens slower. And the fact that it was much closer than the polls are predicting means that it has taken an incredibly long time for it to become clear who actually won the election. We had no idea on election night who was going to win it. It took about, like, it was, it's nearly nearly a week now as we're recording. Um, and it's only just a couple of days ago it became pretty clear that it was going to be Biden. It was, it was, I think it was clear by sort of Friday morning, but it wasn't called until Saturday. It was Friday morning from... UK, so 
you know your mileage may vary. Yeah, yeah, we got the we got the time difference as well, so it um it's all a bit th- weird. Things the events often happen whilst we're asleep. Yes, yeah. we are five hours. Um, well, it depends where you are in America, but um, we're at least five hours ahead of yeah. sort of Eastern Eastern time. Yeah, so five hours ahead of New York, basically. I think up to eight or nine hours ahead of um, Hawaii or something. Anyway, big time lag. So fun. So yeah, we've all been sort of whirling around, half asleep, trying to make sense of what you lot over over the pond have been doing, mm-hmm. which unfortunately happens what he's going to be extremely what important to? for the rest of the yeah. world. <laughs> uh, do we regret? Do we regret the United States as a sort of collective? Do you think the British sort of regret you think that we're responsible? Move? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, say we are to a degree. I, I mean, think that there, there is an element of that in the background Spanish. of the of the national consciousness of thinking whenever yeah. something bad happens in America, we always think, "Oh dear, that's a, we're partly responsible for this." <laughs> we sort of think, "Oh, we didn't bring him up like that." Yeah, but we did. I mean, it's an unfair way of looking at it because obviously, obviously, the Britain and America are both countries full of individual people. None of us were around <laughs> for that, but that is definitely that's. I think that is part of the background of how a lot of people, British people think. Mm, of it. Definitely. Like Canada's the sort of the the high achieving, uh, you know, yeah, you know, sort of got a good job and is and is achieving the 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 bourgeois middle class dream, and America's, you know, <laughs> yeah, Australia's sort of a bit a bit of a a bit of a layabout, but you know they're fun and they, they, <laughs> yeah, they right. you know we they, they get on with people and they're, yeah. they you know they're always willing to lend a hand when necessary, and then yeah. America's just like the problem <laughs> child, yeah, right, <laughs> yeah. Again, this is all delusion. This is not how. People I don't know really what New are, Zealand but are. this is this is the national story that we tell ourselves. I think New Zealand are just forgotten about, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, which is a shame because it's lovely. By and large, they're the nicest. Yeah. yeah, and they've got lots of sheep. Yeah, yeah. More sheep per head than even whales. Yeah, I was about to say they're the whales of the Anglosphere, but then of course whales is in the Anglosphere. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, not all of it. There are, there are well, parts indeed. of Wales up in the north where people still still speak Welsh as the first language. Well, there's parts where it's where that's still the the main language, but all yeah. of Wales people speak some Welsh. Well, they're taught it in school whether they can still. I, most of my friends who are Welsh but uh, can't speak any Welsh now. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, 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 I don't mean all Welsh yeah. people speak Welsh, but like there yeah. in all parts of Wales there will be some people who speak right, Welsh. Right. Yeah. Sure. But in North Wales, there are there are whole areas where people only speak Welsh. So indeed, Anglesey. Mm. Lovely. I love North Wales. I used to go there on holiday every year. Nice. I have very fond memories of North Wales. Less fond memories of South Wales, it must be said. But um, uh, yeah, yeah, indeed. We've gone off on a tangent, but then, as we said before, people that's what people got. That's why, yeah, my favourite parts. So, um, do you think there is a takeaway from the selection? If we can, if we can narrow it down to one big takeaway, um, the the biggest overwhelming emotion that I'm getting from it. Is just relief, yeah. That it's that it, that Donald Trump isn't going to be in the White House any longer. Well, um, well, yeah. Unless there's, we've still got several months to go when he'll still be president. Who knows what's going to happen since then? But and then we got to get we got to get him out. Yeah, yeah. You've actually got you know, to get him out of the building out. with a crowbar. Um, Poss- possibly the Secret Service. Yeah, <laughs> I'm saying pry him apart with a crowbar, like prying two things apart. And I'm not suggesting you actually threaten him with a crowbar. That's not what I was saying. <laughs> Although I did see that. Um, it was I can't remember who said it, but someone said, um, "If we need to, we're perfectly capable of escorting trespassers out of the White House." Yeah, so that was someone, someone was campaign. deliberately briefing the press that, that just floating the idea that maybe <laughs> the fact that anyone has even decided to float that to the press as a possibility is a bit worrying. I think. Yes, um, it does speak to a certain something. But yeah, but what what this says to me, um, also the, especially the fact that it's so narrow, is that this strategy of defeating. Um, sort of reactionary nationalist this this new reactionary nationalist force because Trump yeah that's the thing put it this way um, Donald Trump has lost the election but not by enough to destroy Trumpism as a major political force in American politics in the long term so his brand is going to stay the norm for the Republican Party now he's the new normal for what the Republicans are going to be not necessarily his sort of aesthetic style but his kind of um, Trumpian populism that there's going to be no return to the Mitt Romney style, I don't think. Mm-hmm. Um, so this strategy of put someone like Joe Biden in the White House 
in order to like occupy the space of the White House to just so that we don't particularly like him, but at the very least he's stopping someone worse from being in the White House instead, is unlikely to be a good long term strategy for defeating for, for keeping Trump out of power. If we if we're moving into a mode where the two party system is people like Joe Biden on one side and people like Donald Trump on the other side, meaning that people like Donald Trump are going to be president half of the time, then that's not a good long term strategy. There needs to be a much, at some point, there needs to be a much deeper, more comprehensive defeat of Trumpism than this. This isn't going to do it. It's good that he's out of the White House, but this wasn't enough to deal with the actual problem. I think the the sort of down ballot races sort of speak to that very totally, clearly. Yeah. So the Democrats were forecasted to gain seats in the House. They lost seats. Yeah, they were forecasted to take control of the Senate. They haven't. Um state legislatures across the country many of them have gone to the republicans uh, this, is, this is kind of unsurprising when you think about what the um democrat strategy was for this election which is basically to say joe biden is going to try to be a sort of uh, unifying candidate between s- sort of liberal minded democrat type people and uh, the mythical moderate republican who doesn't like trump but the point of that is you're saying trump is the problem not this as an individual, not this broader movement. And if that's your strategy, then you shouldn't be surprised that that down ballot, that doesn't help you beat the rest of the Republican Party. If you're saying Trump's the problem, not the Republican Party, then you shouldn't be surprised that people are, that a lot of people vote Joe Biden at the top of the ticket and then vote Republican all the way down. Which does sort of suggest that maybe the, the moderate Republican isn't such a myth after all. I mean, possibly, yeah. Or at least yeah. the relative well, well, okay. moderate um, Republican. <laughs> yeah, I think that maybe a better way of putting it is that the idea of the moderate Republican is very often badly misunderstood to the point where the word moderate isn't quite the right word. I think that, mm. that a lot of the Republican voter base and the and the self-identifying as conservative voter base on policy is kind of all over the place. They're not... Most people who aren't massively involved in politics aren't terribly ideologically coherent most of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, people don't think about politics broadly speaking, in really left-right terms. They think about issues that they're concerned about and they think about who do I think is on my side. And I, I think that there is a section of the Republicans who don't see Donald Trump as being on their side and who, who they don't like for various reasons. But I, I don't know if describing them as sort of moderate centre-right conservatives is really a fair summary of their problems with Donald Trump. Yeah, that is fair. The, the sort of makeup of the US electorate in particular is quite odd. It isn't... So there's a great sort of graphic that someone put together about the 2016 electorate. Hmm. And there's this big cluster of votes somewhat in the middle on economic terms, but right near the top um, on the kind of authoritarian, liberal libertarian oh, you mean in like political of, compass terms on, yeah in political compass terms yeah and so that's trump's that was trump's base right yeah i think so and i think that that does seem to be borne out by the data i don't think that is just a, a sort of media construct but yeah it's 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 probably really more i mean we don't have the full data yet but it's probably really more people around the periphery of that people who are more socially liberal but but also probably kind of more right wing in economic terms who are likely to have peeled off to sort of... I mean, the other the other thing, of course, is, again, we, we don't have all the data yet, but it seems that particularly Hispanic voters in especially South Texas and South Florida swung quite sharply towards Donald Trump, which might seem somewhat bizarre um, on the first reading. I mean, South Florida is very Cuban, so... Yeah, so They've Hispanic been voters fairly is, a, is a slightly problematic category because it's an extremely diverse group. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but um, but you know, Southern Texas is very Mexican, Mexican American, um, and that is not a group you would expect to swing towards Trump. Yeah, yeah, not at all. So this is one of the surprises of this election is the way that Joe Biden has done really surprisingly badly um, uh, among certain particular demographics, like worse than Clinton in a lot of ways. I think, in particular, from the preliminary data that we've seen, it's a lot of Latino men, and to a slightly smaller degree, no, I mean, to a substantially smaller degree, but still sort of 
notable given the usual vote um black man as well young young black man yeah yeah um, and not you know normally the vote the the black vote is sort of 90 plus percent democratic yeah, yeah overwhelming and it still still and seems still to overwhelming. Be very high um but, much, but it's more in the region of sort of 85 percent. yeah which is which is a huge downgrade compared to where it was before so i think this is a thing that yeah. um left and liberal people t- t- overwhelmingly see the trump presidency as having been a shambles and now it's over after only one term but that's kind of not how it's being perceived by conservatives as far as i can tell they see it as kind of a success overall he's found a way to make inroads in the in the exact demographics that the republicans have always struggled with and he managed to win an election and come close to winning a second election um he's managed to gain seats in the house of representatives afterwards he's he's infused a base he's got the most votes of any republican candidate for president ever this time around so whilst he's not president in the long term um it's not being perceived as a complete failure no i mean i think i suspect that trump himself will start to be perceived as more of a failure i mean a one-term yeah, president probably. in the united states is it's quite is, unusual is unusual right you you know think about other one-term presidents gerald ford jimmy carter the first bush you yeah, don't exactly. tend to think of them as particularly successful people no but i think but i think th- this i think we should be wary of the idea that this election will prove to the satisfaction of the right that trumpism was a dead end that's not how they're seeing it they're seeing it as oh there was something to this strategy it means that we've made if you dig into the data there are particular sort of inroads that the trump campaign has made to particular demographics which should be very worrying for the democrats in the long term i think it's worth mentioning at this point as well that so part of the reason why um this election was so uh, it took so long to realize to work out who'd actually won it for a long time what we were hanging on was nevada which was steadily counting votes but it wouldn't be called because there were um, because it was pretty narrow and there were lots of votes still to be counted, etc. Um, and Joe Biden looks like he has won that state, but by less than Hillary Clinton did. Hillary Clinton kind of slam dunk Nevada to an extent, mostly off the back of um, Hispanic voters. And the person in the Democratic Party who has done extremely well with Hispanic voters recently, specifically in Nevada, was Bernie Sanders. Yeah. So you've got to say that of the of the deeper long-term warning signs that are underneath this narrow victory for, for Joe Biden, the, there's an argument for saying that the way to fix a lot of those long-term warning signs that are, the, the, the red lights starting to flash on the dashboard is there is kind of a ready-made solution if you're on the Democratic side. It's Bernie Sanders' style politics. I mean, it's also worth pointing out that the Biden victory in Nevada is entirely driven by Reno and Las Vegas. Yeah, yeah, totally. He won no other counties. He only the counties that contain those two cities. Hmm. So it's it's a fragile kind of victory, I think, um, because it it rests on a on a very narrow slice of the population in more than one sense yeah. demographically. You know, it's also relying heavily on urban voters, which which was something that people sort of thought that Joe Biden would do better with rural and suburban voters in Clinton, but it doesn't appear hmm. to have been the case. Yeah, well, that was the strategy was to try to pivot towards um, suburban voters pretty much and and get white formerly republican voting suburban voters to flip to joe biden um whilst relying on the idea that you have these other demographics locked down because they always vote democrat anyway i think the lesson is and it's the lesson that the republicans have learned really well which is that you can't win by neglecting your the, your base there's a there's a saying that has been coming up a lot in american commentary recently which is dance with the person who brought you <laughs> Mm. right which is i think that's very true there's a lot of truth in that especially if you want to build a a kind of party and movement which can consistently win elections in the long term rather than just about squeak uh winning the presidency whilst losing seats down ballot in the in the most favorable circumstances you could possibly have a really incompetent guy on the other side um who only four years ago his own party didn't even really like and the world is falling apart and he's mismanaged a pandemic you can still only just about squeak this out that's not so, a long term I mean, strategy. If it wasn't, if it wasn't for COVID, Trump would have won this. I election, think it's right? very likely. Like, that uh, seems we don't really like Honestly, we obviously we can't really know for certain, but it definitely seems like that. No. Yeah. Yeah. You know, consistently throughout the entire pandemic, Trump's ratings on uh, his management of COVID have been worse mm. by some margin than his uh, management of the economy and than his sort of overall approval rating. Yeah. So that's what's been dragging him down. Yeah. Yeah. If if if, if that hadn't happened. Yeah, well, you've got to see 
um, the kind of neoliberal corporate Democrat style politics and this new reactionary politics on the on the Republican side as they're not like two different visions of America that you can pick one or pick the other because they completely neither would exist without the other they, they, they completely reinforce and bring each other into existence you have to analyze them as a totality so picking the good end of that spectrum isn't a strategy for defeating the other end of the spectrum because they form a single two-party system so if you actually want to defeat Trump more fundamentally you need to build a complete alternative right because if you if you don't change if you bring America back to where it was in 2015 well where America was in 2015 was about to elect Donald Trump so I, I can see a one way to put it would be it's slightly exaggerating this is why I'm hesitant to say it um, but the choice between Joe Biden and Donald Trump isn't the choice between Donald Trump and not Donald Trump it's the choice between Donald Trump now and Donald Trump later I think that is the worry. I mean, we talked, we talked a bit about this last time. You know, people like Tom Cotton and yeah, yeah, totally. That's what I mean. Or possibly even literally, because there's talk of Donald Trump possibly running again in 2024. <laughs> yeah, well, I was wondering about this earlier because I don't think so. Okay, so at the last, in the last Republican primary, the very clearly the Republican Party sort of establishment did not want Donald Trump no. again, and they did what as much as they could to prevent him from winning and failed. Off the back of him losing, if he does decide to run again, they've then got a choice to make, which is, are they going to try and stop him from winning a second time, or are they going to back him? Hmm. Now, off the back of him losing, I think that that question becomes very, very difficult, because the thing is, if he runs again, right, hmm. and the Republicans, Republican elites try and stop him from winning... I think they're more likely to be successful this time around because of the stain of his loss. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, but then the question becomes, what if he runs third party? Right, you know, totally. What if, totally what, if, possible. what if he doesn't win the Republican primary because the Republican elites kind of close ranks more successfully, but then he runs as an independent candidate? What happens uh, then? He absolutely could do that. Um, he'd get a ton of media coverage if he did it. Um, he'd certainly get at least some of the Republican base to come with him. Um, yeah. And he's very much got the temperament to do that. He really does not take losing well. And there's, there is zero chance he's going to be gracious in the following four years. He's also desperate because he has a lot of debts coming up. Yeah, totally. Uh, a lot of really serious, you know, um, debts to various people, which are coming up in the next few years. And I, I think, I think at least in part, his running for president in the first place was an attempt to sort of get behind or get, get ahead of that, right? You know, because yeah, he's yeah. president. They can't really touch him. And I think that's partly why he's been so, so sort of like desperate to win this time and so mm -hmm. raging about having lost because those debts, when they come up, are going to be really, really, really bad for him yeah. and for his organisation. And now he's got a massive spotlight on them as well. Yeah. Because he's not just a reality TV star, he's a politician. And that means you, you, you're held to a much higher standard. Yeah. So running for president a second time might be a way to try and by time. It's possible, on, yeah. On that respect. I don't know. I mean, it's sort of armchair psychologizing at this point. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, so am I. We should get Mary Trump on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Do you reckon she'd come? <laughs> For those who don't know, Mary Trump is 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 Trump's uh, Trump's niece who is a, a, pro a professional psychologist <laughs> and who has recently written a book about how Trump's sort of family upbringing kind of created this mm. monster we, we see before us so she's like the armchair psychologist extraordinaire yeah, yeah. she actually knows him <laughs> yeah so in that vein <laughs> i think i don't think we should underestimate the extent to which part of the question of whether republicans decide to work with him if he decides to run again is uh, i really get the impression that he is a nightmare to work with oh, no one wants yeah. to work with him if they can avoid it so if there's another option they'll go with it Mitch McConnell hates his yeah, guts, yeah, right? Mitch, Mitch McConnell, frankly, is having having the best night of his life. Right? <laughs> he's yeah. got rid of Trump, but he's gained seats in the House, and he's it looks like they might well keep the Senate. Keep the Senate we'll yeah. talk about that in, in, in a bit. But, you know, he doesn't have to do with Trump anymore, but he still gets to potentially block everything Joe Biden mm. wants to do. He's, 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 in, he's in Hulk heaven. Yeah, yeah, totally. You know? <laughs> best thing that could possibly have happened. <laughs> yeah, and, and, the, and the Democrat who's taken the White House is someone who doesn't fundamentally disagree with him on the political direction of the country that much either. No, they probably get on. 
Yeah. So no, he doesn't even have to. He doesn't even have to be that obstructionist because the Democrats aren't going to try and push for very much. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's worth saying that he has. So Joe Biden, this is he has said he's going to uh, restore the Dreamers Act, um, which is sort of the the method by which yep. um, children brought to the U.S by undocumented parents can sort of get citizenship. He's going to rejoin the Paris Paris Climate Accords. He's going to revoke the ban on immigration from certain Muslim-majority countries. (laughs) Forgot that that was even a thing. (laughs) Yeah, so so he is... So Biden is sort of already... Well, he's only just been confirmed as president-elect, signalling that he's going to take steps to reverse a lot of what Donald Trump has done over the last four years. Yeah, yeah. The problem is, is... Is that where he's going to stop? Because if it is, then you're right. We just get another Donald Trump in and another four yeah. years. Because... I think every signal is that is that he will stop there. Well, okay. So this is this is one of the things I wanted to bring up, right? So I would kind of agree with you, except that um, there's this interesting uh, guy that he's picked. So Joe Biden is apparently um, he's tapped uh, a guy called Gary Gensler to uh, be an advisor on economics, specifically on Wall Street regulation. And Gensler was the... He oversaw a lot of the um, reforms to the finance market after 2008 crash under the Obama administration. He's also been quite close to Elizabeth Warren in a lot of her sort of consumer finance protection work. So that's, that is interesting because it, it does... It is someone sort of notably to the left of where Biden himself has traditionally been. Yeah, he seems like he's on, he's on the sort of left Obamaism, as it were. Mm. So the question, I suppose, then is, is this just a, you know, a single person who's just a sop to the sort of li- more liberals? Or, or is this going to be a theme of how he constructs his advice? Yeah, I, th- I think the that difference is still pretty marginal. Uh, like, um, if Joe Biden governed like uh, it's because the Obama administration had people like this in it as well. Um, uh, so there were good things about the Obama administration, but it was quite clearly not enough as well. So I think mm-hmm, if mm-hmm. if the best we're hoping for is that Obama is that Biden will be as good as the good end of the Obama administration, then that's still not really enough. Oh no, of course no. I, yeah, it's nowhere near enough. I mean, we're. <laughs> We agree on that, I think. I mean, I think we both agree that Bernie Sanders is is, is basically a right wing deviationist and should be, you know, <laughs> <laughs> be castigated. Come the revolution, Bernie, what were you doing all this time? Um, not quite up against the wall, but you know, uh, ticking off. But um... <laughs> I mean, if Bernie Sanders' proposed reforms are all pretty moderate, um, like like not not even unusual by the standards of actually actually kind of quite seriously compromising by the standards of normal European centre-left parties. Um, but I'm just going to give a little bit of a take on Bernie Sanders, which is that he quite clearly situates that within a kind of internationalist perspective. The people that he praises worldwide tend to be people much more left-wing than the programme that he was planning to bring to the presidency. So I, I do think that Bernie Sanders is... Uh, I think he's, he's. There are some people that say that he shouldn't call himself a socialist because basically his policies aren't particularly socialist. They're basically sort of liberal or social democratic. They're just quite on the left end of that kind of ideology. I think he is right to call himself a socialist because I think that's that's the. He d- there is a socialist logic behind why mm-hmm. he's proposing these particular reforms in the context of contemporary America. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. I, I, I do agree with you, and I, I think you know you could say similar things about Jeremy Corbyn. But, yeah, um, yeah, right. You know. I and mean, even more so with Bernie, just because his policies are significantly less radical. Than yeah, because he's in. But he, again, he's in. A, he's in a more radical yeah, yeah, right. context. Um, I mean, so talking about Bernie, it's uh, it's worth probably noting that Justice Democrats, which is sort of the group that, or one of the groups that sort of grew out of um, Bernie Sanders' campaign. Yeah. I think it was twenty six of the thirty candidates they backed mm. for Congress ended up winning their races. Um. And also, there's there was some some work done by the Justice Democrats and by the Sunrise Movement, which is the sort of climate change um, mm-hmm. arm of that movement, I suppose, which seems to suggest, and again, the data is only preliminary, but seems to suggest that vote share among Democrats declined 
in races that they lost the further to the right their ideological views were. Yeah, right. Because there's been a lot of talk in the last couple of days as it's become clear that the Democrats down ballot haven't done nearly as well as they were hoping and haven't done as well as Biden. That, oh, you know, it's the socialists, um, you know, pushed us too far to the left and this is the result. But in, actually, in what world, again, the data is preliminary, get but it's just the, the opposite. The Democrats fully did not run on a left-wing <laughs> platform. How can it? No, you, you can't lose because you ran on a left wing platform if you didn't run on a left wing platform. <laughs> I mean, you but then, this that is way. what they're saying. It's just nonsense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I just, I just wanted to bring that up as sort of a, a. Uh, this is just a counterpoint. To that we just have to expect this around. from centrists at this point because if they lose, and they do compromise with the left, they'll blame us. If they lose and they don't compromise with the left, they'll blame us. Um, and. If you win on a left-wing platform, they'll say you would have won by more if you hadn't had a left-wing platform. Like the, the data is irrelevant to how they will respond to it. They will always respond to it by saying left bad. Uh, but yeah, yeah. It's, but, but there is, there is. The point is that the work done by Justice Democrats and the Sunrise Movement that you're referencing, in quite a lot of detail, demonstrates that that is not true in this particular instance. And there's a kind of. Um, as a as a logic of, if you wanted someone with roughly Republican policies, you vote for the Republican. <laughs> and if the Democrat is saying, oh, well, I'm like that too, there's no reason to vote for them rather than just vote for the Republican. So you, if the Democrat's saying something different, saying, oh, I have different, very different policies, then they will convince some people and they will not convince other people, but you've got a race and then you try to win the election. Whereas if the Democrats say, well, I'm doing their program, then no one will vote for you because there's no reason to vote for you. It's just, it's just pointless. <laughs> so you tend to lose elections. Let's just talk about the Senate, shall we? All right. Let's talk about the Senate. Um, so the Senate is on a bit of the knife edge, as I believe they call it. Super duper. Um, so the way the Senate works, for those who don't know, is only a third of seats um, in Senate go up for election, and they go up every two years. And yes, that's really silly, and it doesn't make any mm. sense. Um, why don't they do one seat from each state every two years, and then in a four-year cycle, that would replace every everyone would be up for election. Why don't? Because yeah. there's two there's two seats in each state for the Senate, so when they just alternate, I don't understand. Anyway, they don't do that; they do a silly thing. Um, and the map this year was looking reasonably good, in fact, for the Democrats compared to the yeah. map two years ago. So during the 2018 midterms, even though the Democrats had a real wave in terms of the popular vote won a bunch of seats in the House. Um, they didn't do great in the Senate because a lot of the races that were up that year were sort of either races that the Democrats already held or Republican-held seats that were pretty rare. That would, like yeah, so flip. the map is favourable for you if the states which are up, places where that are marginal but held by your opponent. If there's lots and lots of safe seats for either party up, it doesn't really matter. They're probably just going to stay where they are. If there's lots of marginal seats that you hold, then the best you can hope for is nothing changes, and the worst that can happen is you lose seats. And if it's the other way around, yeah, then then you're liable to win. Um, so the, state still. the Democrats, the Democrats needed to gain three seats in order to win control of the Senate. Um, so they lost their seat in Alabama. Uh, Doug Jones, who previously won because he was running against a guy called Roy Moore, who was a how to put this politely. Mm. He had been accused of inappropriate sexual conduct towards children. So I don't think he'd been convicted. He's not been convicted, okay. Um, I'm not sure, but anyway, just in case. Um, So he obviously won quite convincingly. As I recall, it wasn't terribly convincing. It was very disappointing. No, but it was convincingly for a Democrat in Alabama. Oh, yeah, 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 totally. But it's it's the fact that you could have someone who is an alleged pedophile. (laughs) Um, Yeah. And you can still only just win the election by, you know, have a normal election where roughly half the country, vote, well, half of the state votes for one side and half votes for the other side. It, it, it could speak to a few things, depending on how you read it, other than just the way that American politics is so unbelievably partisan that no matter who is your candidate, you always vote for your own party. Or it could just be the extent to which the Democrats find it really hard to win in the South, because it is Alabama, to be fair. Or it could just be that if you try to run on the other guy is terrible and I'm boring. That doesn't <laughs> tend to inspire massive turnout for your own side. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he lost this time because he was no longer running against said pedophile, allegedly. Yeah. Uh, 
I think that, that speaks a little bit to what I was... Sorry to keep interrupting you, but it, it speaks a little bit to what I was saying before about the presidency, um, that you can sometimes win an election based on the other guy is terrible and I'm boring, if the other guy is terrible once in a while, but it isn't a long-term strategy. Eventually, you will probably lose an election at some point, and then you haven't built anything that lasts. Um, and then the Democrats won... Uh, flipped two seats, one in Colorado, where John Hickenlooper, the uh, former presidential candidate, remember him? Mm, I do. Oh, he won a Senate seat. And then um, Martha McSally got kicked out in Arizona because no one likes her. <laughs> um, so the Senate, the Democrats are currently at one seat. They needed three for control. It looks like the remaining seats that haven't been called yet will go to the current incumbents in North Carolina, Alaska, uh, Connecticut places like that so it looks as if the map when all votes are counted will be republicans 50 democrats 48 that leaves two seats which are not going to be resolved anytime soon because uh they're both in georgia one of the seats was up for a special election which is american for by-election yeah because the, the Republican incumbent had been appointed to the seat after the previous incumbent had died. So that election is a special election. Uh, and in Georgia, in special elections, they have jungle elections where everyone who wants to can run. And therefore, two Republicans uh, ended up running, splitting the vote between them. And no one's won a majority, so that goes to a runoff. Mm. I think that the idea is that it's because it's out of the normal cycle, um, so you can avoid having to go through a normal primary process as well. So you just throw everyone in and see who gets voted for. So um, so that that will go forward to a runoff on January the 5th. And then the other seat in Georgia came down to a close race between John Ossoff and Purdue, I can't remember the right. guy's first name, a Republican. And that seat also looks like it will now go forward to a runoff. It's not confirmed yet because they've still got a few votes to count, but that now also looks like it will go forward to a runoff oh. uh, on January the 5th. So we are now in a situation where what's likely to happen is control of the Senate and therefore of Congress and therefore of the trifecta and therefore of the ability for the Democrats to get anything done will go forward to two elections in Georgia on January the 5th. So if you thought this election was over, mm-hmm. <laughs> not yet. Yep. So even if the Democrats win both of those, that means that they'll be at 50 50, right? I got that right. That if you're including Bernie Sanders as a Democrat, because of course he's actually an independent senator. Yeah, and the other independent who caucuses. Yeah, yeah. There's two independents actually who caucus with the Democrats. I can't remember who the other one is, but and, Bernie and Sanders in and ties in the Senate, the tie is broken by the Vice President, who is of course a Democrat if uh, under a Biden administration. So they would just in the most marginal way possible. <laughs> well, you say that. I don't think. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that we should necessarily say. Uh, someone is a Democrat, of course, because they're under a Biden administration. That's not necessarily true. <laughs> well, that is a good point. They, they could... I wouldn't surprise, it wouldn't surprise but, me. But as it, as it happens, he's got, he's, it, it, it will be Kamala Harris. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's true. But it would be Kamala Harris after this election. Yeah. Um, so it's worth mentioning as well that the Senate doesn't just operate by simple majorities because they have the filibuster. So the Democrats would, have, even if they win both of these and also have the vice presidency, and have two independents caucus with them. They've just got the most razor thin majority possible. They they are a long way from having a filibuster proof uh, majority. So they still probably couldn't get anything done. <laughs> yeah, well, t- I mean, people are talking about getting rid of the filibuster anyway, so. I think they probably will get rid of the filibuster. That is true. Honestly, and it, there has they, been some progress on that, as I recall. They've, there's been, they've gotten rid of the filibuster for some votes. Yeah. Like um, a Supreme Court yeah, confirmation the don't have the filibuster that. anymore. Yeah, they did. Because the Republicans wanted to confirm their uh, candidates, which might come back to bite them now. Watch our last show. <laughs> yeah, or listen to it. Well, the problem is a lot of the stuff we talked about last time is only really possible if the Democrats won the Senate convincingly. Yeah, um, because there's a couple of Democrats who are quite conservative, relatively speaking, and probably wouldn't mm. go for certain things. So things like court packing, things like statehood for dc and puerto rico those are all a bit more up in the air now even if the democrats do win georgia i think it would be possible to sort of um to overcome that if you had um a party leadership which was 
strongly committed to getting something particular done and willing to fight for it because then they can they can twist arms and do politics basically to convince people in their own party who don't want to vote for this one thing uh-huh. you can get people to vote for things that's what fdr did it's what um lbj did etc mm-hmm. and that is not the leadership that the current democrats have well it's because he doesn't have a name that's made of three letters yeah yeah totally um the Democrats probably won't be able to get much done because of this setup. But the thing is that even if it wasn't for this setup, they probably wouldn't really try and get very much done. This gives them an excuse. This allows them to throw out their hands and say, well, it's because of the Republicans, we can't do anything. Yeah. So it's the responsibility of the left of the Democratic Party to really, really, really push them and hold their feet to the fire. Yeah, totally. And I think that's going to be the role of people like Ocasio, Cortez, and mm-hmm. Sanders, and people like that up and down the party. Yeah, and the, the now expanded left of the party. Because he's, he's getting to the point now where candidates endorsed by people like Justice Democrats and the, and the Democratic Socialists of America um, are, are forming a proper caucus now. And, you know, Because previously there is such a thing as the Progressive Caucus, but that's a very ambiguous organisation. They're forming a, a left caucus within Congress that, that's left of that, right? Made up of people yeah. like AOC and Jamal Bowman and Cory Bush and Ilhan Omar. There, there's, there's quite a few of them now. Yeah. I mean, Ocasio Cortez was saying this before the election. You know, she was saying, you know, these people, they say to me, oh, well, you're only four votes. And so she said, well, I'll go and get more votes then. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> and right. It looks like that's what they've done. And it is much more now. Yeah, so that, that's one situation where this is one possible positive spin on the fact that the Democrats have lost votes in the House is that terrible old school neoliberal Democrats in marginal seats tend to be the ones that have lost their seats, whilst at the same time, um, lefties who have won their primaries have then handily won their um seats so so not only is the the left portion of the congressional democrats expanded but the overall democrats is slightly contracted so as a portion of congressional democrats the lefties are a significant much bigger force now there's a point i heard made that's just occurred to me which i think there's a certain truth to this that this is a distinct difference between this kind of new rising left on the left of the Democratic Party in America and the British equivalent, which is sort of Corbynism, um, which is that they've happened in very different ways in that Corbyn became leader of the Labour Party in 2015 in a complete shock that no one, including Jeremy Corbyn, expected and suddenly inherited all of this party machinery and had to govern it with an extremely unruly party underneath him um, and then ultimately was unable to, to, to manage that in such a way that they could end up winning an election. Um, whereas in, but which meant that, the, but that's because that there was there was no groundwork done beforehand. They hadn't built up a whole party machinery. It sort of unexpectedly the left got the got the leadership of the party and then had to build a groundwork to support it, and kind of to an extent succeeded, but not in time to actually end up winning an election or bringing the party together around this new program. Whereas the the left Democrats are kind of doing it the other way around. They they haven't been able to win the leadership of the party in in any serious sense, but they are steadily building all of the groundwork that you would need to, at some point, uh, fundamentally change the party. So yeah, I, I think there's 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 room for hope there that um, that even though they're in a way progressing slower than the British left was, they're doing it in a way that has much firmer foundations. Yeah, oh, I think that's a very good point. Yeah, because because like there are. When Corbyn was resigning as leader, it it took quite a while for the left of the party to work out who was going to be the left candidate in the new leadership election. Mm. Whereas the the Democrats already have several high profile, like charismatic, good on camera, strong left wing people who um, are clearly uh, young people as well. So they're going to be a long time for for the Democrats going to have the left Democrats are going to have no shortage of people to be standard bearers for the left of the party in future primaries. There, there is an extent to which that's happened in the British Labour Party as well. There are many, many more Labour MPs who I see as like really, really good political actors. But yeah, I wanted to talk about a couple of because um, in America they, in some states, they have uh, what are called sort of ballot measures or ballot propositions. Oh yeah, yeah. Similar things. They call them different things in different states, but they're the same basic thing. They're basically little mini referendums that they have alongside mm. the general election. Um, and so yeah. there's some fun ones. Um, I just wanted to talk about a couple in California in particular. So, so uh, mm. for example, Californians <clears throat> voted in favor of Proposition 17, which restored the right of people convicted of felonies to vote after they're released from prison. Very, very important. Which is extremely good. Yeah, cause, because felonies are, are a very, very broad category of crimes in America. Um, and 
overwhelmingly the people that are convicted of it. It's, it's, it's basically a way of, it's a form of voter suppression having felons not be able to vote. These are often people who haven't, who maybe 30 years ago committed a crime or possibly didn't <laughs> because of, um, you know, the American criminal justice system isn't great um, and now can never vote again, no matter how, you know, clearly it is that they, that they are back on the straight and narrow. Overwhelmingly, these people are black <laughs> uh, and therefore democratic yeah. voters. Um, so, yeah, yeah, there's a there's a strong element of the the long running process of suppressing the votes of marginalized people who tend to vote Democrat. Yeah, this is part of that broader swing. And uh, it's very, very good that that is no longer true in California. There was a Proposition 16 didn't go through, sadly. Um, it was going to, if it had gone through, it would have allowed affirmative action. Oh, cool. Granting people, uh, but it didn't go through. This is the way it's the way it's written is a bit weird because there was a, another proposition back in 1996 which introduced the ban on affirmative action, and so this one is repealing that proposition, which looks like a good thing until you think about it. Um, hmm. Yeah. The other one that did go through that was really bad was uh, so uh, Proposition 22. Yeah, yeah. Uh, considers app-based drivers to be independent contractors and enact several labor policies related to app-based companies. So basically this was a bill sponsored by Uber and Lyft mm. and companies like that. It seriously reduces the amount of of statutory rights that employees of companies like that have, basically. Yeah. There was a law passed by the California state legislature which forced companies like Uber and Lyft to treat their employees as employees, but this proposition has overturned that now. So now they don't have to anymore, which is bad. Uh that was a real disappointment. Yeah, very bad. A huge amount of money went into the campaign to try and get that that passed by the by these companies. I'm spoken to people in California, and they're like, the, the vibe was that people didn't even really realise what it was. That it, people, um, I've, I've heard people saying that they voted for this because because workers' rights, <laughs> because they thought that this was the more progressive end mm. of the spectrum. Yeah, there, there was a very very successful, <clears throat> very targeted, very well funded propaganda campaign. On this particular issue yeah yeah they, they they put more money into this it was something like something like it was something like 60 million dollars or something went on um uh, ballot measures in florida and most of that was this particular one which is kind of money that you know 20 years ago would have won you a presidential election yeah. no, no ridiculous ridiculous on the other hand, uh, there was there was a good one in Florida, which increased the minimum wage to fifteen dollars yeah, an hour. Yeah, very much so. I think this is this is an interesting thing about these um, ballot measures, which is that they do mm. on the whole. They're not, it's not always, but they do on the whole tend to come out significantly more progressive than the election of candidates. Like people are so much more likely to vote for an increase of the minimum wage than they are to vote for a candidate who says that they're going to increase the minimum wage. <laughs> I don't really know mm. why that is. Uh, I think it's because it's it's quite easy for sort of you know, the right and the right-wing media to sort of attack individuals. Yeah, it's easier to make it not really about attacks. the issues. Whereas you can't... Yeah, whereas you can't attack a ballot measure without homonyms, mm. really. It is pretty much always the case that on the issues, on the whole, people are... Um, this is a bit of an oversimplification, but on a lot of issues, people are significantly more left-wing than their politicians. Um, but people identify with different political labels and, um, and with and see different politicians as being symbolic of various loads of other stuff. Now, there's, in, in the election of politicians, there is all of this very, very complicated stuff over the top of what do you actually want them to do. And it's very easy for the media circus to make it not really about the issues. Whereas on the issues, the public is broadly pretty left-wing. Although ideologically incoherent with it, you'll get people who are all over the place on various issues. But on the whole... Um, the, the swing is that way. So if you can, if there is some aspect of the democratic system which cuts through that and puts and by the structure of the way that it operates, puts the issues right in the centre, then I suppose in, from that view, it's quite unsurprising that it, that they tend to come out more progressive than normal elections. And so I, I quite like these um, the, these ballot initiative type system more than I like referendums in the way, in the way that we do them in this country because there's like it's properly built into the constitutional system that there is a process for drafting the question for how what gets on the ballot and how and how it's phrased and whatever um, whereas in this country uh, there's there's like there's no real referendums just don't work with our constitution they don't they, they don't have the advantage that ballot initiatives have that I was just mentioning where they cut through all of the other stuff straight to the issue referendums always become symbolic of loads of stuff in this country the, the two big ones that we've had recently are the Scottish independence referendum and Brexit. 
and they have, are both about like to an extent they're about should britain be a signatory to this treaty or this treaty or whatever and to an extent they're about uh you know should scotland you know how should the british scottish border operate and where what big precise powers should be in holyrood and which ones in brussels and which ones in london but uh, that is a quite actually quite a small part of what all this debate has been about over the last six years it's been about so many different things that it's become symbolic of so many different things of a cultural divide in the country of a yeah, you get what I'm saying. I absolutely do. Yeah, and it, and you're right. You know, clarifying the specific question, clarifying the specific policy that will be implemented if the ballot proposition is assented mm. to, is is crucial. And it's the the fact that that wasn't done before the Brexit referendum in particular is a huge, huge. I mean, it, it should damn David Cameron's memory yeah, for totally. all time. Really, I mean. Um, he has to bear the, the overwhelming responsibility for that. Because, I mean, the SNP, in fairness to them, did do that for the Scottish referendum. They did come up with, you know, extensive uh, sort of white paper on what they w- would plan to do were Scotland to go independent. Yeah, yeah, totally. um, w- but, but Cameron just didn't do the equivalent for Brexit. And that was a deliberate choice. You know, people in the civil service were telling him he ought to, and he deliberately chose not to. Mm. Now, the, the questions that you see in other countries, in countries where they do this kind of thing a lot, like in Switzerland, the the question in the referendum paper tends to be really long. Like there's a page of legalese specifying exactly what this is going to be. Uh, there there is a whole process for you know refining exactly how the question is phrased so that everyone knows exactly what it means. There are people who are responsible for implementing it by law if it goes one way, and people for, responsible for implementing the opposite measure if it goes the other way. Like it's actually built into the constitutional system, whereas. The Brexit question, I think, was just, mm-hmm. should Britain remain a member of the European Union or leave the European Union? Remain, leave. And that was it. And there was no one explicitly responsible for implementing it either way. Um, it had no legal force at all. <laughs> um, but also it had this enormous de facto force. And so it, it, it really made... Um, it's got this kind of overwhelming mandate from the fact that it's it's such a specific question um, that is then voted on by the whole country and there's a campaign before it just like an election or whatever but then so, so it's this overwhelming mandate which which overrides the manifestos of parties but which also is very vague in what it's asking for and the political class in general is collectively responsible for implementing it rather than there being any particular person. Because if you get an elected on a manifesto, then you are then responsible for implementing the policies of that manifesto. But no one in particular is responsible for implementing mm. Brexit apart from just all politicians. So yeah, that, that was the fundamental problem of the last four years of British politics is the fact that there's this, over, there's this disconnect between the British constitution and how it works and how policies are supposed to be presented by politicians and then they either get elected on the basis of that and should do it or not and this overwhelming mandate for something very very vague is why it's been impossible to deal with just because it it's simply there's this complete mismatch between what people what different people think they voted for because people voted for brexit for different reasons and what politicians are supposed to do with that result <laughs> I think that leads us very nicely into what we wanted to talk about next, which is <gasps> Brexit oh, yeah. and what all of this means for us. So for the Brexit country. <sighs> the Brexit country. Yeah. Basically, the, the gist is, is that Boris Johnson's Brexit plans leaned quite heavily on getting a good trade deal with the United States. And the Democrats... Uh, including Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden, have pretty clearly said that he ain't getting no trade deal as long as these sort of shenanigans with the Irish question keep going on. So you probably remember this, but but Boris Johnson's government sort of a little while back passed this bill, um, which um, was going to give them an out from the Northern Ireland Protocol of the EU Withdrawal Act um, under certain circumstances which the EU was obviously extremely annoyed by. Um, It ended up leading to, eventually, to a cessation of negotiations. Legal proceedings were brought by the EU against the UK over this. Obviously, it's damaged our relations with Ireland very considerably, but also has pissed off the Democrats, because a lot of Democrats and the Democratic Party as an institution 
have very deep roots in the Irish American community. I mean, Biden himself is descent is is of Irish descent and is you know is Catholic and is in, in part of that sort of milieu. And many Democrats are like that. You know, you have to think about people like John F. Kennedy and and so on. So they were basically very clear that if they had anything to say about it, Boris Johnson wouldn't be getting a trade deal without respecting the Northern Irish Protocol. And now that the Democrats have won the presidential election and have kept the House and might even uh, win the Senate, stay tuned, um, mm. they now have the ability to sort of enforce that. Yeah, it's, it's certainly an, it's an area where the, regardless of what's happening in um, Congress, the White House has quite a lot of latitude to do what it likes in international yeah. politics. But I think any any trade deal, any trade agreement would probably end up having to be voted oh, by, yeah, 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 by totally. Congress. Oh, well, it should have gone to the Constitution. And, but... <laughs> yes. And, in um, the Constitution that, you know, that um, the president can't declare war, that Congress has to vote on that, but that's just been ignored for 20 years. Well, that's because they passed that act. Yeah, the one under Bush that allows you to attack, because um, Al-Qaeda is not a country, and they passed a, a war powers resolution uh, on that. They've, they've then really, really stretched the definition of this to allow them to do basically what they yeah, like. Yeah, and you, up to a certain amount of troops doesn't count as an invasion. It's all very... Um, it's all very... Yes... But yeah, so Brexit, it's not going to work now, is it? It wasn't really going to work before, to be fair. <laughs> it's not, it's not going to work. Um, yeah, uh, so I think a particular vision of how you're going to do Brexit, this this very sort of um, radical process where Britain completely cuts ties with Europe and becomes a sort of free-floating member fully of the Anglosphere and not of the Eurosphere. Because it's the, it's the particular sort of qualia of Britain that we straddle this divide that exists in in the, in the nebulous notion of the West between the U- Europe and the Anglosphere, where we're the country which straddles the two. Mm. Um, and it, it, it is looking like uh, America is shifting to a international posture which will not let us get away <laughs> with LARPing as the, as the new leader of the Anglosphere anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear, yeah. yeah. Boris Johnson just so desperately wants to be Winston yeah. Churchill. Yeah, totally. And he really isn't. Like, there's very little similarities between them, other than the fact that they're both very right wing. No. Yeah. But he he so desperately wants mm. to be. He's exactly what he wants to be. And Britain wants to be the Britain that it was when Churchill was prime minister, or, or at least some British people do. I think that there is a way to read this whole rise here um, of the populist right in Britain as a. A country which has declined a lot in international influence. We no longer have an empire, basically. Still having enough sort of residual um, clout to, if we really wanted to, pretend that we're still important, but not actually be important. <laughs> uh, there was something... Um, oh, what's his name? Britain's still a very big, important country, but it's just that we're not like we were. There's something that um, Dennis Healy, that's him, um, said... I think it was Dennis Healy anyway, said that Britain needs to get used to the idea of being an... Uh, oh, I can't remember exactly the phrase he used. It was like an offshore Austria or something, or an island Austria, um, <laughs> rather than, uh, uh, you know, a superpower. And I kind of think that the, the quicker we get used to the idea... Because being Austria is not a particularly bad prospect. <laughs> but we can only be that if we give up on the idea of being 1920s Britain. Yeah, right. Know what I mean? We we could be a normal European country, which is not a particularly bad prospect, uh, but we refuse to accept that that is that is the rough mould of any realistic positive vision for Britain. Mm-hmm. The longer mm-hmm. we pretend that we can still have the role on the world that we did before the Second World War, uh, the the longer we will continue to not take up the possible position that we could have in the twenty first century, which is not necessarily a bad one. And Brexit doesn't have to be about that. Whether we're in the EU or out of the EU, we could still go for that vision. Um, but Brexit is currently being used to for those purposes. It doesn't have to be. We could be out of the EU and still accept that and still be Austria, as it were. Yeah, yeah. There's this, there's this very deep suspicion in the UK of any sort of Europeanness. Mm, yeah. I don't know where it comes from. It comes from a lot of things. It, it probably has something to do with our being yeah, an totally. island. I think it probably has something to do with um, the experience of empire, definitely. I think it might get back further than that, though, because, you know, you only have to look at European wars in the sort of early modern period and how, you know, the Thirty Years' War, for example, which we sort of stayed completely out of. You know, really, England and Scotland have been this little thing unto ourselves for so long. I just think there's this 
there, yeah, there's there's a very deep suspicion among a lot of people that that might ever change. Yeah, historically, times when we've had to care about Europe tend to be because something's going terribly wrong. Europe is bad news if it's if it's yeah. on the news. Uh, I can see that. Yeah, and so how this comes back to the American election, I think, is that Trump being the president allowed us to get away with the pretending that uh, that we're still the British Empire for a bit longer, and Biden won't. I'm a little bit hopeful. I don't. I'm, I'm not actually that hopeful, but there's a possibility that this will that this will nudge Britain towards. If we've got these two visions, which we, which we might as well call the British Empire vision and the Austria vision, um, Trump allowed Britain to get away with pretending that the British Empire vision was possible for a bit longer. Um, and I think it might be good for Britain to be confronted with the fact that it is not possible. And the Biden presidency will make that a bit clearer, I think. Because w- that will happen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, whether we embrace it or try to resist it is the question. And that fact, Trump being in the White House, allowed us to deny Mm. I am knackered. I'm basically falling asleep on my desk. <laughs> um, I apologise to the listeners for my absolute lack of of, of being like checked in at the moment. It's fine. You just listen to David. That's that's the only reason you come. <laughs> just to listen to David. I'm just. I am just ah, the I... medium <laughs> through which David is delivered to you. I know. I know. I know what my role is. Oh, not at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I was going to mention a brief it's, just, it's a very very brief point It, I think in concrete terms um, I've heard something about uh, this, is, this is not official channels but it's, it's, there's been a certain amount of buzz in the press that the government are um, likely to cave in the uh, trade deal discussions that are ongoing at the moment they're going to concede and, and keep certain um, European minimum standards on stuff in order to get a trade deal with the EU um, I think that that uh, wouldn't necessarily have happened if it wasn't looking like the election's going to go this way. I think I actually heard that before the election, but uh, but everyone expected Biden to win anyway. Yeah. Which is good from our perspective. <laughs> Let's get back to our favourite discussion. The reason why we both got into politics was to talk endlessly about trade deals. <laughs> I was somewhat radicalised by uh, TTIP, actually. That's yeah, actually that's not true. completely um, incorrect. I remember when that was... That was going along. Um, not TTIP, um, the, the transatlantic equivalent, but um, the one that was going to... Oh, no, no, that's uh, TTIP. I didn't like that. that is TTIP's TTIP, the okay. Atlantic one, and TTP is the Pacific one. Of course, because they couldn't make them, like, obviously <laughs> different, could they? That would be ridiculous. It's because the, the Pacific gets a P, but the Atlantic is buried within the first T of TTIP. It's, it's transatlantic trade and investment partnership. <laughs> Whereas it's Trans-Pacific Partnership. So it's <laughs> made it deliberately unclear. They have done. I remember I started a change.org petition when I was in sixth form, I think, against oh TTIP. God. Makes me feel a bit old. The reason why TTIP never got in um, implemented in, its, in, in that form was because Francois Hollande kicked it into the long grass. God, imagine, <laughs> remember when Francois Hollande was French president? So long ago. <laughs> oh, I do. I do. I mean, it was only three years ago, but... <laughs> Oh God, really? Yeah. That, that's when Macron became president. Yeah. Oh my God, it was only three years ago. It feels like forever. Yep. I'm so old. <laughs> so old. 2017. Sure. Should we move on to the fur? So move on to fur, though. Then, yeah. Yeah. So, um, for those who aren't aware, we're back in lockdown, folks. Woo! This is, this is nationwide. Well, it comes around so quickly these yeah, days, it does, isn't it? It feels like we just had one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so we're back in lockdown, and for a little bit, it looked like Rishi Sunak was going to refuse to um, extend the furlough past the point Dickens. it was about to end, um, and instead he was going to offer a much lower rate of benefit, which we talked about on our f- uh, sort of comeback episode uh, last week. He mm. has now been forced to climb down on that, and the furlough at its full original rate of 80% of earnings is going to be extended, it's now been Very confirmed, good. until the end of March next year. I mean, the fact that he even held out for so long on this, even even saying that there wasn't going to be a furlough until um, until a certain point, uh, that was quite a while ago now. The fact that he's delayed so much has defeated a lot of the objects of having furlough. Because the point is that people aren't going to be able to work for a while. Um, but instead of having mass unemployment hit instantly as soon as you go into the lockdown, you have furlough instead. But if you say, no, we're not going to have a proper furlough scheme, then companies fire people. Because <laughs> they have to. 
So it's it's not just a matter of having furlough. Saying that you're going to early on and making that clear to people is a really important part of it. So going into it late isn't just a matter of doing the same thing later. It makes it much less effective if you wait this long. Yeah. Part, part of Kasama's pitch against the Tories is, is not just that they're socially unjust, but also that they're incompetent. And he does have a point. This, this, does, this is a much more incompetent government than I was expecting. They're just... They, to be fair, they're under much more strenuous circumstances than they were probably expecting when they first got elected. But they do make lots of unforced errors and then have to use her. Yeah, I think Boris Johnson, when he was at City Hall and he was mayor of London, he didn't really do much work himself. He's, most of his sort of responsibilities ended up being delegated to various vice mayors, they were called, who were these sort of like hired guns. Mm. Um, they weren't elected or anything like, like that. They were, they were just sort of appointed positions. Um, I think he sort of tried to carry that same structure over into being prime minister, um, which has sort of led the direction of different departments to be sort of very autonomous, and there's not been much direction from above, with the result that the kind of healthcare mm. response headed by Matt Hancock and the kind of economy response headed by Rishi Sunak has kind of not really been aligned with one another. Yeah, this is just an idea that literally just occurred to me as you're saying that. But I wonder if that plays into um, their ambitions for reforming the, the, the state and the, and the civil service. Because that if you have a prime minister whose style involves uh, lots of delegating, then it's very important to, if you're going to do both of that and maintain a lot of control over the political direction of it, you have to have a situation where the, where the political part of the state has a lot of power. Right, I'm mm. not especially this because it's an idea that's only just occurred to me. But you've got to you've got to take power away from civil servants and put it in the hands of your uh, of the the rest of your own appointments and the and the uh, political appointments and your your advisors and stuff. If you're going to have that, if you're going to both keep control of the political direction of policy and not do any of the work yourself. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a very good point. Yeah, I think Dominic Cummings also does have ideology on the issue, but yeah, I don't yeah, think Boris Johnson does particularly. Yeah, I don't think this is where it's coming from, but I think it, they think they play mm, into definitely, it. Definitely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, again, this all sort of... We talked about it last week, this kind of slow de, um, disappearance, this kind of aura of magic and competence mm. around Rishi Sunak. He's lost yeah, a lot totally. of his luster. And we talked about it a lot, and I think this just goes to show even further that he, he has it, he's been pretty soundly defeated on sort of within the, the structure of, of the the government now yeah right? you know this is a big win for matt hancock and for you know other people in the cabinet who are pushing against the sort of very austerity 2.0 economic policies that rishi sunak's been been pushing um this is a big it's a big loss for him personally i suppose the question is is it also a loss for that kind of politics in general do you think mm. this shows a kind of repudiation within the upper echelons of the Conservative Party of the kind of neo-liberal yeah. sort of pure Thatcherite politics that has been sort of characteristic of them for a long time. I think to an extent, but ultimately no. They're, they're, um, I think furlough as an idea is it, kind of something that they were always going to have to do. You can't have a lockdown without furlough because for one, not just because it's unjust, but because it won't work. Unless you pay people, unless you give people a livelihood that allows them to stay at home, they won't stay at home. <laughs> So yeah. if you want to have an effective lockdown, you have to have furlough with it as well. Um, but it it completely goes against the whole ideology that the Conservative Party is based on. You, it's a massive state intervention directly into people's own bank accounts. Uh, you're, it's, it's literally a handout. <laughs> so if you've got this ideology that the state is always bad, get it out of the way, that, that's, that's how to solve problems. Uh, it's just, it's always something which is going to sit uncomfortably with them. And the fact that they have been forced into doing it is, is another example of how the government is being put in a position that they don't want to be in ideologically. So I'm not surprised that they resisted it because because uh, it, it just doesn't compute for them, this kind of policy. But it is also the only logical thing to do in the context. I mean, there are other things you can mm. do. You could do universal, um, a universal basic income or something instead of a furlough situation, which I think kind of would have been better because there are lots of people that fall through the gaps of furlough. Um, uh but yeah, they're doing something. But they would be just as uncomfortable with doing that. So I, I think this situation and the policy direction that is required, uh, it completely um, is at odds with what the conservatives think. So they've sort of been forced by circumstances to behe- to, and they've been forced, they've been drag kicking and screaming by circumstances to behaving like they're not neoliberals. 
by some of the circumstances here. Like, I don't know if it means that they're really ideologically, there's actually going to be a long-term shift on it. I think that's mm-hmm. that's still an open mm-hmm. question. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's fair enough, yeah. Yeah. No, I think, yeah, I, I, I expanding um, expanding universal credit is definitely something that they, they can't really do because it's been such a major plank of their uh, entire policy going back to 2010 yeah. that they they want the benefits system to be sufficiently meager and so as to kind of maintain labor discipline basically mm. to keep people searching for work and so that people can't fall back on uh, on social security and, and the same with universal basic income it's why i don't think even though there are many sort of right-wing thinkers particularly in america places like silicon valley who are big big sort of proponents and big fans of universal basic income i can't see the the conservative party falling in behind it because they're so committed to this idea of you know quote unquote making work pay and, and keeping people keeping people constantly um terrified of losing their jobs yeah. so they have to keep the benefit system terrible yeah yeah well that's the ideology behind universal credit but it doesn't fit a world where there's going to be um it certainly doesn't fit the middle of a lockdown <laughs> uh, but it doesn't really fit the world that we're going to move into as we get this virus under control, which we hopefully at some point will, uh, which is going to be that there's going to be a much higher baseline level of unemployment, even in quote-unquote good times now. That was going to be the direction anyway because of things like automation. Um, But I think this... I think it's a running theme of this crisis that it has really accelerated lots of trends that were going to happen anyway in the 21st century. It's made... It's it's allowed lots... Put it this way. Pushed lots of societies out of a kind of inertia from the 20th century that was that was allowing them to not fully give in to trends that are going to happen in the 21st century. Like, uh, the geopolitical alignment of the rise of China has been significantly accelerated by this situation. The decline of America and the rise of China as world leaders um, was going to be a thing in the 21st century anyway, but there has been, because of this crisis... Uh, being a sort of rupture it's allowed the the 21st century trend to assert itself i think that that's something that's happening with unemployment as well that the the unemployment's not really going to ever go back down kind of it it never went back down to pre-2008 levels there's lots of precarity and underemployment and uh and stuff anyway and even that's going to start to evaporate um in the long term because of automation and that has been accelerated by this sudden jump up in unemployment you're right there can you still hear me? I think we may have cut out. Yeah. Can you hear me still? Hello. Oh, hello. I disappeared, but I am you, back You now. did disappear for a bit. I don't um, know if I finished my point about I agree with everything. <laughs> I agree with everything David just said. Could you hear it? <laughs> no. Oh, okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure it was really good. Yeah. It usually is. I just no. basically continued elaborating the point about um, long-term unemployment being and being a trend that was going to happen in the 21st century anyway and coronavirus accelerating it. Definitely. And also, uh, not just unemployment, but also remote working becoming a... Yeah, yeah, totally. Again, that was, that was incipient for a long time, but coronavirus has pushed that over the edge, I think. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think that there was a lot of... Even though we'd been in the 21st century for 20 years, th- there was quite a lot of 20th century baggage still hanging around. People still thought about politics and the economy and things in this kind of 1960s to 1990s frame. No one really believed that the 20th, 20th century was over. Until now, I think this is the moment when things really start feeling super duper different, and the qualia of the twenty first century asserts itself. Does that mean it's going to be like this for the next eighty years? <laughs> it's not going to be exactly like this. It, we're at the sharp end of this particular crisis, um, but there there are there are a lot of things which look like they've suddenly appeared because of this crisis that were actually always on the cards, and they've just appeared quicker and and more suddenly because of this crisis, and they will never go away. Because the fact that we didn't have them already was only a factor of inertia anyway. Which might be good, might be bad. There'll be probably a mixture. <laughs> like the fact that people can... There was an, there's an awful lot previously of people not being able to do remote working for no good reason. Even though it would have been better for them, uh, better for the planet, because they don't have to commute, give them more um, you know, flexible working time. And there was no good reason why they couldn't do it before. And this is this has proved that it is in fact possible. That's just a quick, good example. Uh, I'm, I'm stuck on a uh, trying to find um, positives out of coronavirus kit now. Uh, it was quite likely that we're going to have diseases like this a few times throughout this century. We've already had three. Only one of them actually went worldwide in a significant way. Um, and we're quite lucky that the first one, which was so dramatic that it made everyone really wake up to this issue, that 
uh, global pandemics can happen in our kind of globalized world was not more deadly than it was. Like, this is a, what's particularly distinctive about this one is that it's very contagious, not particularly that it has a really high death rate. Um, but it is probable that at some point we will get one which has that terrible combination. And we're just lucky that it wasn't the first one. So that it was the so it wasn't the one that caught us completely by surprise. Under the pressure of technical difficulties, comrades, we are forced to pause here. Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about uh, the Nagorno Karabakh slash Artsakh war and about the protests in Poland. We will come back to those next we will. time. Um, but for now, thank you, comrades, for your time and attention. Be excellent to one another. Viva la revolution!